Okay, I guess we're online on YouTube. I'm gonna gonna ask people if everything is okay on YouTube soon. Oh, okay, I think we're already broadcasting. We have, we already have an answer. Uh, I'll just wait for a couple of minutes so we have more people on YouTube. Olá pessoal, boa tarde. É, já coloquei aqui um, um, um aviso para que vocês peçam, como a gente não tem como acompanhar, eu não tenho como acompanhar o YouTube ao mesmo tempo, então por favor me avisem se houver alguma falha na, na imagem, no som. A Dayana está falando da Argentina, então a gente não sabe se, se a gente pode ter alguma complicação aí na, na transmissão, então por favor deixem avisado aqui. aqui. É, Vou dando boa tarde a todos. Em breve a gente vai começar a palestra da Dayana. A Dayana vai falar inglês. Acho que vai pegar mais gente do que se ela falar espanhol, né? Aqui, no exato momento. Mas sintam-se à vontade, especialmente os alunos, mas também os professores, sintam-se à vontade para fazer as perguntas em português. A gente faz a tradução para ela e a gente tenta adaptar da melhor forma. Então... Ah, por favor, fiquem bastante à vontade de, de extrair aí a maior parte de... Uh, uma quantidade de informação que vocês puderem da Dayana. É, acho que já vou começar a apresentá-la. Então, vou mudar para o inglês para que ela possa é, me corrigir se eu, se eu falar alguma coisa de errado, né? É, so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start in English now. Thank you, Dayana. I'm gonna start thanking you to, uh, for your... Uh, for accepting our invitation and it's, it's a big pleasure to have you talk uh, for us a little bit about, about your work. Um, I've met Diana in 2016 I guess uh, so uh, it's been quite a while that I don't hear her talk and it's it's I think it's gonna be a great pleasure for, for everybody to, to, to hear her speak. Um, so Diana is uh, graduated in Argentina in the University of Buenos Aires. She did her master's in chemistry and her doctor, uh, doctorate in philosophy of chemistry also in the University of Buenos Aires. And then she went on to do her postdoctoral um, uh, in Indiana University uh, with Professor David Giedrich. Uh, Giedrich, Giedrich. Yeah. <laughs> in the Department of Chemistry, and she specialized in biochemistry and biophysics, uh, especially uh, working on um, structural uh, changes of proteins and how they, like little changes of proteins can uh, make a big difference on the functional, uh, the, uh, functional part of the, the protein. So um, we're very glad to have you here and thank you so much. I hope we, everybody enjoys the talk, so. Thank you, Priscilla. Oh, Thank you for oh, the sorry. I forgot. I forgot. 
Oh. Uh, there was a lot of things that I was going to say about all her prizes, but I already put on the on the email that I spread. So Diana is a young professor in, in Little Art Institute, and she got a lot of prizes recently. So she's like a, a, a star in, in Argentina. <laughs> and she got the L'Oreal Prize and a Pew Fellowship. And so she's, she's, she's got some great, brilliant ideas. So I hope everybody enjoys her talk. It's, it's always a great pleasure to, to talk science with her. So I, I hope uh, we can all enjoy it. Thank you, Diana, again. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, well, it's it's my pleasure to be here. I, I mean, obviously, I would rather be there uh, in Rio with all of you and, and see your faces. We hope uh, to have you here soon for Caipirinhas. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, true. Um, but but still, it's it's really nice to be able to to take advantage of these tools that we all have developed during the pandemic to to be able to be there with you and still be at home. Um, so, um, uh, again, uh, as, as Priscilla is saying, uh, one of the best things about the fellowship that we both share is to get to know more Latin American scientists that are excellent in their fields and, and be able to share research with them. And now with, within, between our institutes. So um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about something that I guess that it's not entirely in your area or in your zone of comfort. Uh, that it's it's talking about um, bacteria in in very general terms. That that's something that you probably all are aware of how bacteria interacts with the human host in particular. Uh, but focusing in some. Uh, biomedical aspects that have to do with transition metals uh, and polysulfide homeostasis. And something that, that we are really excited about is that uh, for a really long time, uh, bioinorganic chemists as myself had been understanding fundamental aspects of how transition metals work in bacterial pathogens. And we think that there are a lot of areas that are in common with what we call, sorry, polysulfide homeostasis. And, and again, these names uh, may not mean anything, and I hope that by the end of the talk, you get an idea of what they are and why they would be important if you are thinking about microbial pathogens. So first, I, go, I wanted to introduce my laboratory. Uh, the name of the laboratory is Physical Chemistry of Infectious Diseases. Um, and, and essentially, uh, the idea is to try to understand uh, very fundamental aspects, uh, particularly thermodynamics and dynamics, experimental dynamics that you can measure with, uh, with NMR, uh, in, in proteins that are essential for bacteria to survive in the human host. Um, and we try to answer those questions with the lens of evolution, what are the evolutionary advantages oops, sorry, that bacteria uh, have uh, or, or uh, harness in order to survive in the human host? Uh, and the lab is very recent. It started when I came back from the US in 2019, right before the pandemic. But it has grown tremendously, and I'm really glad to share the lab with this amazing group of people. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have been doing in the last three years or so. Um, so essentially, we, as I was telling you, uh, we are very interested in looking at proteins that, that are, are important in interaction between bacteria, for instance, intracellular bacteria, and the human host, for instance, different cells from the human host, for instance, macrophages. And something that happens when uh, the human host tries to get rid of, of pathogenic bacteria, is that the human host competes with the bacteria for nutrients. Um, and the particular aspect of metal nutrients, of transition metal ions, is that it, uh, the human host can take advantage of restriction of this nutrient, but also the fact that these nutrients, transition metal ions, are toxic in excess. So bacteria can either starve, um, the host can either starve bacteria for these nutrients or intoxicate bacteria with these nutrients. 
So uh, here I'm showing you uh, an example that blows my mind, that it's like the protein that is in charge of getting manganese inside human cells, that is this transmembrane protein, is exactly from exactly the same protein family than the bacterial version. And they both try to, uh, both the bacteria and the human host uh, incorporate mutations on this, or have incorporated mutations on these proteins in order to keep this balance and get both what they need. Uh, of course, that is an evolutionary advantage uh, on, the, um, on the bacteria on the one side, because it can get man ma uh, manganese, uh, that is an essential nutrient, uh, when this protein has uh, very uh, 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 ligands that, in, that manage to have a tight coordination of the manganese. But on the other side, these, these ligands also begin to appear in different vertebrates. Uh, so it's, it's a nice example of co-evolution in the same protein function in the fight for manganese. Uh, uh, and this is a, a neat example where it's very simple and you can uh, trace evolution to, to the, uh, the co-evolution of these ligands in the bacteria and in the human host. Uh, but things are more complicated, uh, particularly for iron. The human host has evolved a whole set of proteins that will uh, try to uh, chelate iron and start bacteria from iron. And, the, and also similarly for zinc. And the way that the bacteria uh, respond to that is very diverse, uh, but it's mostly regulated by metallosensors that will turn on transcription when these stressful conditions appear in the human host. Uh, so for instance, uh, the hemoglobin and transferrin will uh, um, chelate iron in the blood. Uh, so bacteria cannot colonize the blood because there is not enough iron ions, and those are essential for the bacterial cells, uh, and bacteria can uh, in, in, compete with that by, for instance, uh, synthesizing siderophores. Uh, and the siderophore synthesis is tightly regulated by a metallosensor that responds to iron. And, and it can get even more complicated than that because, uh, for instance, zinc is essential for uh, an, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and, and essentially, uh, it's, it's a, a most, um, a lot of uh, lactamases are zinc dependent. And uh, when the, the human host restricts um, uh, zinc and also takes antibiotics, then the bacteria needs to build an adaptive response to that, those two stressors. And that is also regulated by metalloregulators. Uh, uh, and, and essentially one of the mutations that are picked up in that uh, uh, in, uh, or have been picked up in the course of the last half century uh, involve having uh, uh, selected um, proteins that can bind zinc really, really tightly and uh, prevent the host from chelating that zinc from the proteins that degrade antibiotics. So again, this is a whole world of uh, what nutritional immunity and metallostasis is. Um, and there are a lot of uh, different angles to look at this problem. The angle that we choose uh, as bioinorganic chemists is try to think uh, about uh, how bacteria can maintain uh, homeostasis of different transition metal ions. And, and it's really interesting in that aspect, at least to me, the fact that uh, it's it's that we know that all these metal ions are important and the total amount of these metal ion goes, it's really high, and it goes uh, with the complexity of the lifestyle of the bacteria. The one third of the enzymes or, or of the proteome uh, essentially needs uh, the correct metal ion for proper function. Uh, but the, uh, the window of availability of each of these metal ions is 
tightly defined. Uh, and essentially, uh, it's, it differs a lot from the total quota or the uh, total amount of metal ions that you can find inside bacteria, because most of it will be bound to proteins. Uh, essentially, like that's the, the example of copper is clear. The free copper inside the cell is essentially one atom of copper inside the cell, although there are plenty of copper proteins that need to be properly metallated. So the total concentration of copper is much higher. But the cells need to maintain copper availability really low because otherwise most of the proteins that can bind a metal will bind copper. And if you bind copper to a zinc enzyme, essentially this enzyme will become inactive. Uh, so it's really important for bacterial survival and for cell survival in general to keep these windows of availability uh, following uh, this, uh, this trend uh, that goes against what is called the Irving Williams series that tells us that copper has higher affinity for, uh, for proteins that therefore if it is accumulated in a high concentration it will metallate everything and everything will be a copper enzyme and therefore most, en most metalloenzymes would be inactive. So how the cell defines these windows of availability has to do, or the minimal model on, that explains that, is the set point model. The set point model de, uh, defines these windows of availability thinking exclusively on the transcription regulators. So the idea is simple. Uh, if, if there is too much zinc in a cell, there will be a, a transcriptional response that uh, in, that um, transcribes uh, an efflux regulator that will become active when zinc is high. So if zinc is high, you will get you will transcribe an efflux regulator that will release all the zinc out of the bacteria. If there is too little zinc, bacterial survival is also at risk, uh, and therefore uh, there will be a transcriptional response that has to do with encoding an uptake really a membrane protein that will uptake the zinc because the cell is starting for, for zinc. And that defines the windows of availability. This is an idea that has been built, been built uh, over the last two or three decades. It started with iron and then uh, it became clear I mean, it started, in fact, in the 50s when this idea of, availability, of, of metal availability and affinities uh, became clear. And the set point model is about 25 years old. And we have been looking at these transcription regulators and confirming how these windows of availability became, uh, are, are held within the cell. Um, so this idea of metallostasis Maybe it's new to you, but it's pretty established in the field. Uh, and with that idea that each metal needs to be uh, whole within a window, uh, we started thinking about how these molecules evolve. You need a transcription regulator for each metal, and it needs to be specific. So by looking at that, we, we, um, we found or we have described that most of the transcription regulators the, that are known to have uh, most of the transcription regulator families that are known to have members that can sense transition metal ions uh, are have can have a really common a, a, a really distant common ancestor if if there is one that is a helix turn helix uh, binding protein uh, and uh, and these proteins families come in two flavors. One flavor is a protein family that concerns uh, the overall molecular architecture. But if you look at all the members, you can see that a, a lot of um, a inducer recognition sites or metal binding sites have evolved. So essentially, in this family of proteins, the uh, zinc, cobalt, and nickel are generally sensed uh, or bound uh, in, a, in a site on the top of the molecule here. While the members that can sense uh, arsenic or, or, or lead bind here. 
Um, and all these proteins bind DNA with the same motifs that is down here. So here we have a question on how these sites appear in the course of evolution, but also how these sites are connected allosterically to the DNA binding site. These two sites need to be collected because uh, essentially when a metal is bound here, the DNA binding affinity will change and that would elicit a transcriptional response. Um, and on the other side, the, 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 um, the flavor, the, the, the other kind of flavor of transcription regulator are this guy, these guys where all the different uh, stimuli that can be sensed, different metal ions, uh, are all sensed in the same site. There are just mutations in this site that can turn a protein for sensing zinc to sensing copper, for instance. And one thing that in, in, in trying to classify how these families were, one thing that, uh, that became clear is that in the same families that you find uh, metalloregulators, proteins that regulate uh, transcription in response to changes in the concentrations of transcription metal ions, trans of uh, transition metal ions, do also uh, sense or response to reactive oxygen species, reactive sulfur species, and reactive electrophiles. And that was new to us because those two fields were completely separate. The uh, reactive, uh, the, the redox community didn't think, didn't talk to the metal homeostasis community as that often. Uh, and it seems that in the course of evolution, these two proteins, these two kind of, of, of functions share the same molecular architecture. So we try to take that one step further and think if the framework that we use for metal homeostasis could be applicable also, for instance, to reactive sulfur homeostasis. And that is what I'm going to try to talk to you about today. So trying to wrap up this maybe kind of uncomfortable introduction, uh, I want to introduce what are reactive sulfur species. Reactive sulfur species um, come from uh, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide has been first described as a gasotransmitters in mammals, not in bacteria. And for decades, hydrogen sulfide, that is what gives uh, eggs, this uh, rotten eggs, this really weird smell, uh, was viewed as a respiratory toxin. Uh, because it can inhibit the, the electron transport change. Uh, but later on, it was found that low concentration of hydrogen sulfide could be phys physiologically beneficial as vasorelaxant uh, in the same way that NO is a vasorelaxant, but also in protection to reactive oxygen species because it's a reducing agent. Um, later on, several enzymes were uh, identified in mammals that could biosynthesize endogenously um, hydrogen sulfide to exploit these beneficial effects. Uh, that's the story in, in, in eukaryotes, and it's an ongoing story. There are a lot of people looking at uh, brain uh, diseases um, that, that has to do with... Uh, um, or can benefit from uh, endogenous production of hydrogen sulfide and reactive sulfur species that come later on. In bacteria, the story developed slower. At first, it was seen more, most like a curiosity of purple and green sulfur bacteria that can complete photosynthesis with, hy with hydrogen sulfide. Uh, later on, these, some of these bacteria also uh, were uh, described uh, in terms of how they, they could metabolize uh, these uh, so, uh, reactive sulfur species, either through uh, oxidation or through reduction, uh, essentially to maintain some uh, level of hydrogen sulfide in, inside the cells that was beneficial and not toxic. Uh, but in the recent, uh, like in the last, um, I don't know, seven, eight years, it became clear that this is not just something for free living bacteria, that is interesting for free living bacteria, but it's also critical for pathogens. Uh, it's clear that in the gastrointestinal tract, there is a lot of hydrogen sulfide and very little oxygen, and the bacteria living there need to deal 
with that, with that very particular condition. But also it, it became clear that, uh, again, accumulation of hydrogen sulfide that can lead to different reactive sulfur species that are these species that are shown here, um, can, uh, can protect bacterial cells from uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. And those species are also seen when you stress bacteria with antibiotics. And in terms of antibiotics, there is a paper from last year that I find fascinating that it's uh, that shows that these reactive sulfur species can directly uh, break the beta-lactam ring uh, and bacteria can become um, uh, resistant to antibiotics by directly modifying uh, these uh, antibiotics by reaction with uh, hydrogen sulfide. So there are many um, biomedical questions where hydrogen sulfide is important. Uh, and, and that um, convinces us that it made sense to try to think if it was possible to think about hydrogen sulfide homeostasis in the same way that we think about metal homeostasis. And with that idea in mind, we uh, start gathering this information about how um, hydrogen sulfide and reactive sulfur species could be beneficial at low concentration and, uh, and toxic at high concentration, and look for transcriptional responses that could orchestrate this, that could uh, prevent bacteria from getting intoxicated with hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and in that way, in the last 10 years, uh, the group that I did my postdoc in uh, and I myself have identified three families of uh, bacterial transcriptional regulators that indeed uh, can fix uh, the, the concentration of reactive sulfur species in a beneficial window for bacteria. Um, and essentially these three families uh, are FISAR that I'm not going to talk about today because it's a very complicated and interesting protein. Uh, that we know very little about. We just know that it can do this. It can elicit a transcriptional response in response to uh, or when, when the hydrogen sulfide and reactive sulfur species level are higher. Uh, but there is no structure. We don't know where the sense inside really is. So I'm not going to talk to you about today uh, about that, that family. I'm going to focus in two families of proteins that we have been characterizing characterizing in terms of metal regulator, and they can also sense, and we have shown that they can also sense reactive sulfur species. That is the CSTR proteins, uh, where, uh, as I was telling you, is the flavor where there is a single sensing site that mutates that can turn a metal regulator to a reactive sulfur species regulator. Um, and SQRR, that is a reactive sulfur species regulator that has a site that cannot sense metal even by mutation. Um, so uh, let me start with this ESTR example. Uh, this is a, a protein, CSTR is a protein from this family of proteins that is called CSOR. That is a protein that binds DNA that it looks like a donut. Uh, it's a tetramer, a homo tetramer that binds uh, metals or a reactive species in this site that binds uh, DNA on the side of the molecule is a really odd uh, DNA binding motif that is not fully understood. But early on uh, in the discovery of this family, it was clear uh, that there was a four site, uh, a five residue site in the interface between protomers uh, that could bind copper and bind other metals, but can also bind reactive electrophiles, for instance. The question was, what is determining selectivity? Why uh, these two cysteines can sense copper uh, and these two cysteines can, do not sense, sense copper at all and sense only reactive sulfur species? So in order to answer this question in the last few years, we have been looking at the family with bioinformatic tools and defining uh, what I'm showing you here, that is a sequence similarity network. Essentially, you cluster the different proteins. Each node is representative of a set of sequences that are very, very similar. And it's associated with other nodes uh, by sequence similarity. 
Uh, so essentially, cluster one uh, is, is, uh, um, shows a lot of proteins that are more similar in sequence than the ones that are in cluster free. And the ones that are in cluster free are similar within cluster free. Um, so the sequence similarity networks uh, can be used to suggest what the function of each cluster might be. Uh, in that sense, it's nice to see that the characterized members of the families that I'm showing you here with arrows are a, 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 all in the same cluster. Essentially, all the characterized members of this red cluster one are copper sensors, while all the, these two characterized members the, the, in cluster three are reactive sulfur so, so species member. And we can separate the nickel uh, cobalt sensors from uh, these copper and reactive sulfur species sensors. So we can define a set of sequences that have um, possibly a, a copper sensing function instead of a reactive sulfur species sensing fun function. So the nice aspect is that we can go back and look at these sequences and look at the geometric context and kind of validate the sequence similarity network. Uh, and, and essentially what we, uh, since there was no information about how a reactive sulfur species could be sensed, we focus our attention in a mostly uncharacterized cluster of putative reactive sulfur species. Uh, and, and by looking at the sequences, it became clear that we could uh, find, uh, again, this pattern that was uh, described only aligning a few proteins, um, where we see that there are two cysteines that are essentially conserved between the copper clusters and the reactive sulfur species clusters. And uh, while the copper cluster has this histidine that is not present here, and has an additional residue uh, that, that is also, sorry, that has an additional residue that is uh, the minus one of the cysteine, that is uh, tyrosine. Uh, again, the genomic context uh, enables us to further validate uh, the, the functional assignment that we did for the clusters. Uh, essentially, most cluster one would have in the genomic context uh, copper transport, while the cluster four, that is a reactive sulfur species sensing cluster, will have, uh, would have, in most cases, uh, a rhodonase that is a protein that, that enables uh, to metabolize uh, reactive sulfur species. So essentially, uh, what, what this told us is that maybe the difference was here. It was known that this histine is important for metal coordination, so it made sense that these proteins would not bind copper, but that didn't explain why these cysteines weren't uh, able to respond to reactive sulfur species. So essentially what we did is a set of mass spec experiments to define uh, how reactive the different cysteines were. And what we saw is that indeed the copper sensor uh, was less reactive than the reactive sulfur species sensor, which is something uh, that was exciting because maybe what the evolution did in the course of evolution, what, what happened is that reactivity of the systems were, was modulated by the environment. Uh, and to, I don't want to describe this experiment in detail, but essentially what this experiment does is uh, uh, that most of the reactive system or the solvent exposed systems will become alkylated with this uh, with this uh, chemical probe. Uh, so if there is no, um, uh, sorry, uh, if, if, it, if it's very reactive, it will be, react with this chemical probe. So you can see that this is very reactive because it's, it's becoming uh, modified with this chemical probe uh, that comes second. And if, uh, and if it, it's not reactive at all, essentially you only see this chemical probe. Um, I can go about that uh, in more detail if you want, but essentially, just trust me that uh, we saw that that indeed the copper sensor reactivity was diminished when compared to the reactive uh, sulfur species sensor. And what we saw the uh, context of this cysteine in the copper sensor 
Essentially, what we saw is that this staining was kind of covered by these two residues that we saw in the sequence similarity network that were conserved. So that told us, okay, maybe these two residues are not only important for copper bonding, but it is they are also preventing uh, other reactions with uh, other stimuli that are not going to sense be sensed specifically, that you don't want that reaction to happen because you want this sensor to be specific for copper. So essentially, uh, what uh, what this pre what this predicted in terms of the of the reactive sulfur species sensor is that the that this system in the reactive sulfur species sensor would be open to 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 the solvent and very very reactive. So this would mean that this sensor was re uh, was reacting with reactive species and not with copper. And so we solve the structure of this sensor. And what you can see here, if you compare the copper sensor here that I just show you with the reactive sulfur species sensor that we solve in this work, uh, is that this system is indeed very open to solvent. Uh, and that correlates with our reactivity experiment. And that suggests that in the course of evolution, uh, this protein has lost these ligands. Uh, these copper binding ligands, and that uh, implied that uh, this system has more reactivity and therefore could be more selective towards reactive species. Um, so uh, now, I guess that with the last 10 minutes of the talk, I will switch gears to this family, where it's not just tweaking a site but just building a completely new site with a completely new allosteric connection to sense a different stimuli. So essentially, as I was telling you, this family of protein has different sites that have evolved. Uh, these sites are not in the same protein. Each protein has a, a set, a, a single site. But if you, over, if you look at where site, the sites have appeared in this common molecular architecture, they are distributed throughout the molecule. This uh, family of proteins can also sense uh, trans transition metal ions. Metalloids are reactive species. And during my postdoc, I spent a lot of time trying to understand how a zinc responsive regulator works. Um, and essentially, that gave rise to a set of hypotheses on how this family could have evolved. And we are test, uh, beginning to test those hypotheses by trying to look at, at distantly related proteins, sorry, distantly related proteins that are reactive sulfur species regulators. So essentially, to remind you how these proteins work, uh, these proteins are transcription regulators that bind tightly the DNA when the, uh, the cell doesn't, it's not at risk of being intoxicated by zinc. And when a lot of zinc comes in, the protein will bind the zinc, uh, get re uh, be released from the DNA, and allow the expression of a zinc exporter. Something very similar can happen with reactive sulfur species. Uh, when the protein binds reactive sulfur species, that gives rise to derepression, and uh, that allows transcription of a lot of genes, not just an, a transporter, that would metabolize these species and decrease toxicity. But again, the question that we are trying to answer in terms of molecular evolution uh, is how these new allosteric connections evolve, because the zinc sensor uh, binds metal here, and the reactive sulfur species binds metal here, but they both bind DNA down here. So these sites need to be connected with the DNA binding site, and that allosteric connection needs to have evolved from this common ancestor. And that's the question that we are trying to, to answer. And the evidence that we had from the zinc sensor uh, is that when the protein binds zinc, the affinity changes dramatically for DNA. But what we knew is that the protein structure remained almost unaltered. There was nothing structurally happening that would explain why the protein got, was released from the DNA. So that kind of evidence um, uh, suggested that maybe uh, we should look 
closer at other properties and not just the coordinates of the atoms in a crystal, but how the protein breathes in solution, how the, um, the atoms within the protein dynamics change upon zinc binding. And we can do that by using NMR. So in, uh, with uh, re um, nuclear magnetic resonance, we can look at different probes that are here as, as, as spheres um, in a molecule. These are side chains of, of, of the protein that we're interested in. That is a zinc sensor. And we can look at how dynamic changes. And the way that these uh, dynamics changes is in, in different time scales. So for this uh, experiment, and I make it a really long story, very short, we looked at very fast internal dynamics, sub nanoseconds is just how thermically the protein is, is, is moving in a very short amplitude. Um, and what we saw uh, is that most of these probes uh, were, were uh, increasing, were becoming less flexible. Flexibility in this experiment is, um, is described by this parameter that is called order parameter. So when the order parameter increases, the order increases and the protein becomes more less flexible in this time scale. So with zinc binding, what we saw is that the protein itself was becoming less flexible. A lot of probes are blue, essentially. And that's what you would expect. When a protein binds a ligand, uh, the, the protein becomes less flexible because it has to bind the ligand and therefore it cannot the, the residues cannot move anymore. That is an oversimplification, obviously. Um, <coughs> and what we saw when we look at the DNA binding process and how the order parameter changes upon DNA binding, we saw that the whole protein was becoming more flexible, which is something that you wouldn't expect, but it's actually not that unusual for the systems that this has been measured. The protein is a polymer, so it can make huge, uh, like really good contacts with the DNA, and that will make those residues rigid, but the rest of the protein can indeed become flexible. What is interesting is that when the protein becomes more flexible, uh, th that is thermodynamically favorable. Flexibility disorder is thermodynamically favorable. So that these flexibilities increase in, in entropy, uh, or increasing disorder uh, was something that we could, with N by using NMR, uh, quantify. And we saw that one third of the total driving force for binding DNA corresponded uh, to this increase in flexibility. The protein was making good contacts, but was becoming more flexible also. Uh, and those two contributions was, were defining a good DNA binding. So the hypothesis that we came up with is essentially what is happening when, when zinc binds is not that the structure changes, but the protein freezes, and therefore it cannot access this highly flexible state and cannot bind anymore. This, uh, I hope that this is not too crazy for, uh, for you that are probably not thinking about entropy as frequently as I am. Uh, but essentially what this is telling us is that we do not need a molecular wire to connect the zinc site to the DNA binding site. The whole change in flexibility may explain how this protein regulates DNA binding affinity and elicits a transcriptional response. So that idea was really exciting to me because that meant that maybe all these sites that appear throughout evolution were connected to this DNA binding site allosterically by changes in flexibility, by affecting this, what we call entropy reservoir, that is the increase in flexibility that we saw when it bound DNA, uh, when it was bound to DNA. And essentially, uh, we, we started to test this hypothesis uh, by looking, by seeing if we uh, characterize a different member with a different allosteric site, uh, having the same, um, having the same dynamic uh, response. If the dynamic response was conserved throughout the family. We started testing that one by one. 
But essentially, we became interested in this reactive sulfur species regulator. We were the first to solve uh, how this protein uh, sends uh, reactive sulfur species, that is the, through uh, with these two cysteines, that instead of forming a disulfide bond, form a tetrasulfide bond with two sulfur atoms in, inside. This is the first structure of a tetrasulfide bond between two proteins, within one protein. Uh, and, and again, uh, as you can see uh, here, the structure doesn't change much. If you overlay them, essentially, they, the, the DNA binding helices are not, not very different in conformation. Both conformation are kind of incompatible with DNA binding. So that suggested that maybe it was true that indeed in this system, dynamics were changing more than how a structure was changing. So we went ahead and used NMR to, to, um, uh, to measure dynamics. Uh, and this is all unpublished, and I hope that we can publish soon. But essentially, what we saw by looking at the side chains, this is a, it's called an HSQC. It's a regular NMR spectra where uh, you can see here each of these peaks correspond to a probe that is a side chain, a methyl in a side chain. And what we can see that is that indeed the same thing that we, we were seeing, or a very similar thing that we, to what we were seeing with, with the zinc binding protein, we are seeing here that when the protein binds and forms the tetrasulfide, it becomes more rigid. Uh, uh, while the structure doesn't change much, uh, nor in the crystal, nor in solution. Uh, and, and tetrasulfide bond is indeed freezing internal dynamics. Uh, and, and in the last year, we went ahead and tried to test the hypothesis of this protein becoming more flexible upon DNA binding. As you can see here, all the peaks are labeled, which means that we have assigned all these peaks and we can show how this order changes site specifically. We are not at that stage uh, with DNA binding yet, but what I can tell you is that the protein is becoming more flexible, flexible upon DNA binding. So uh, that is indeed what we saw with, uh, with the zinc sensor. Uh, and that kind of begins to test this hypothesis that maybe dynamic properties in this family has allowed this different allosteric site to have evolved in the course of evolution. Um, and I guess that or th those are all the results that I wanted to share with you today. I hope that it was not too much out of your comfort zone and you could grasp something. But essentially, what I, I think it's the take home message uh, of this talk uh, is that the bacteria need to have homeostasis of different molecules and ions within the cell. Uh, and, and, and it seems to have found a common uh, way to solve this problem that is evolving allosteric uh, transcriptional regulators that can either uh, evolve a specificity by mutating a single site or evolve a specificity by taking advantage of molecular dynamics uh, or, or internal protein dynamics to evolve different sites that are all allosterically connected to the DNA binding site. And there are a lot of questions that are, we are still in the process of answering, but I hope that some of what I said made sense. Um, and with that, I want to thank the group. Uh, as I said, they have been fantastic. For the, uh, they, they deal with the pandemic in a way that I didn't, I guess. Uh, and thank, uh, uh, again, my, my former advisor and now collaborator that has host some of the people in my group uh, in the last two years. And, and, and how all, a lot of great members that have contributed to the work that I show you today. So with that, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, I Diane. Hope still Hi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we're still here. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, thank you for your talk. I just uh, asked people to send out their questions, but I have a couple of questions that, sure. um, that I mainly like doubts that I had. But um, thank you for your great talk. And, and um, so I, I have my main question, I guess, is um, on the well, actually, there are several, but 
when you said that uh, beta lactans can, I mean, the bacteria can thin out uh, uh, H2S uh, exactly. in the presence of beta uh, lactans. Uh, my doubt is, uh, do they sense beta lactans and they, in the beta lactam, lactam, uh, I mean, the antibiotic presence can induce uh, H2S sensors? Or well, yeah, I I I don't think that. Uh, so essentially, uh, I think that that this. So let me get back to this. These three enzymes that can produce hydrogen sulfide are present in mammals, but there are some distantly related proteins that are present in bacteria as well. The transcription regulator the regulation of these enzymes is not clear mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course uh, hydrogen sulfide homeostasis uh, it's important also for regular metabolism like building cysteine and methionine uh, so there a lot of these these proteins are constitutively expressed Mm -hmm. um, because this, for instance, CSE is, is, is uh, the first step of cysteine catabolism. Uh, so it needs to be expressed to a certain degree because cysteine needs to be catabolized. Um, but, uh, but they are known to respond, like the transcription, not maybe the transcription regulator, but the, the expression of these proteins is known to respond to reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. Uh, the actual molecular mechanism of that response, it's not clear, as far as I know. Okay, I'm getting some questions like here through WhatsApp as well. So um, one is um, Professor Lilian Moreira said, congratulations for your talk. And she's asking if these proteins could serve as therapeutic targets. Um, although these are bacterial proteins, um, can they bind to non-bacterian DNA target as well? So I guess mm. two questions, right? Uh, let me let me answer first the first one, which is easier for me somehow. Um, so uh, within this family, the second one that I show you, there is a, a protein. This is not published, so I, I since Priscilla uh, was uh, said that it was important for to leave the, the talk in, in YouTube. I didn't include uh, that data, but I think I can I can tell you a hint of that. So this protein uh, that is from Vibrio cholera uh, is uh, works as an activator through um, competition with he bacterial histones and regulates the expression of hemolysing that is a toxin from, from Viria cholera. Um, and it's also a very important virulence factor. So uh, there is some research uh, in the direction of, of uh, testing small molecules that would attenuate Viria cholera and Viria gulificus virulence by, um, by targeting that protein. The problem is that these are soluble proteins. So targeting them, it's not ideal in some sense, but, but in that particular example with Vibrio, it's, it's, really, it's a really interesting target because it's an activator. And since it has these very odd cysteines, uh, you can uh, um, search for covalent uh, molecules that would covalently modify those cysteines and render that protein inactive. Uh, and Vibrio um, virulence decreases significantly. So it, it has been the focus of antivirulence uh, type of therapeutical strategies. And, and, and we became really excited about this system because we, uh, by studying it uh, biochemically and, and in the cell as well, we figured that uh, it was wrong, that it's not an ROS sensor, it's an RSS sensor. And we think that that has to do a lot with how virulence uh, in Vibrio has to be modulated in the gut in response to reactive sulfur species. And that's an ongoing story. And I hope that next time we meet, maybe in person, I can tell you more about that. And the second question about uh, if they can bind um, a, um, exogenous DNA or DNA from other organisms. I, did I understand that correctly, Priscilla? Yeah. Yes, so it's, um, they, uh, although they 
the question is, although these proteins are bacteria, uh, are from bacteria, can they maybe bind to DNA that it's not from bacteria? Can they bind exogenous uh, DNA? The problem is, I mean, they they do bind uh, DNA. Uh, they do form complex in specific complexes with DNA, but uh, they they do recognize a, a, an operator sequence, and that operator sequence has evolved in bacteria. So I guess that the possibility is is there that they would bind DNA that that doesn't come from bacteria with some affinity, but the affinity will be much less than for the cognate. Uh, operator. Um, the operator, it's not super conserved, so it, the possibility of binding other DNA, it's, it's, it's there. It's just an 80 rich region, uh, fully palindromic, because it's, uh, it's a dimer, so it binds DNA here and here. But again, like I cannot say no to that, but I don't know an example where that has been measured. Okay, so, so the other question is, um, can zinc and H2S bind at the same time to, to the same sensor? And can they... Well, that, that, is a, that is something that, that we think that we have... So for the systems that we have characterized, uh, that is not true. And maybe this is the best example. So um, essentially, um, uh, here, sorry. Uh, this... This protein, this is a copper protein from Staphylococcus aureus, and this is a reactive sulfur species sensor from Staphylococcus aureus. If you intoxicate the bacteria with copper and with reactive sulfur species, um, both will be turned on. Uh, but if you use reactive sulfur species, this doesn't respond. If you use copper, this doesn't respond. Although, if you isolate these two proteins, and you treatment, treat them with copper, with high amounts of copper and high amounts of reactive, uh, uh, reactive uh, sulfur species, they will react. The, the difference is the window uh, of reactivity. So their reactivity is tuned to make these sensors specific. It's not that a, a, a reactive sulfur species sensor will never uh, bind copper. It's just the affinity will be not high enough, so it will never be turned on in the cell. In this case, that has been tested. Of course, it remains an open question for sensors that we have not characterized. So you also showed that there are several um, spots that they can bind, right? And I, I, I'm not sure of the, of the of the right name, but is the freezing of the of the protein or, is, or the flexibility of the protein the same wherever they bind, or does it change in terms of like is there any spatial difference on the freezing, and that that could lead to different um, spots yeah, one on thing the DNA that, that they can bind. Of course, uh, like. At first, when we started looking at dynamics, we were expecting a local change, like dynamic freeze, uh, dynamics being frozen in the site where the binding occurs. Um, and that, that it's not the case. And in most cases where this measurement has been done, the change in flexibility is more global than local. And that is something really interesting in terms of how you build allosteric connections. Like here, the, the proximity of sync uh, becomes essentially frozen. Um, but there are some groups that become more flexible, and there are some groups that are frozen that are not close to where zinc binds. Um, so it's not a local response. So that is a, in, that is also a suggestion that, that, that you don't need a new molecular wire. If it was a local response, you still would need to wire that response, that dynamic response to the DNA binding site. And, and since it's a global response, all the protein is changing conformation in terms of flexibility. Uh, and therefore, that affects globally the DNA binding process. And that's essentially what we saw with the reactive sulfur species sensor as well. You sense reactive sulfur species here, but you see a lot of freezing over here. Did I respond to your question? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, so the other question that I got here was, um, I think I understand, I hope they understand this is right, but uh, so 
I think when you showed at some point, I think in the beginning, um, different amounts of different ions that you know the were needed, and there's a, a threshold of each one. Um, is that the same for different kinds of bacteria, different organisms? In terms of toxicity and starvation, that probably changes even in the same species, even in the same strain of bacteria, wherever they adapted, you know, to live. Um, how, how, how do you see so, this? Uh, essentially, they are, like what I show you is this most simple model that would suggest that these windows depend exclusively on the regulator. So if you have a bacteria that encodes for a copper regulator with different affinity, the window will switch to the affinity of the transcription regulator because the, the affinity of the transcription regulator where the transcription regulator responds defines the window. That being said, uh, so uh, in, in with that perspective, there uh, is a, a nice example, for instance, um, like copper is generally uh, sensed by, um, by proteins that bind uh, copper with an affinity of 10, uh, of 10 to the minus 19, really, really tight. Again, one free molecule, one free ion of copper in a cell. But for instance, in Streptococcus pneumoniae, sends copper with a protein called COPY that senses copper in this window. And if you measure copper in a Streptococcus pneumoniae, you will get free copper in a Streptococcus pneumoniae, you will get a, high, a number that is higher. The quota won't change. The amount of copper inside Streptococcus pneumonia won't change, but the amount of free copper will. Um, and again, there are, and, but this doesn't only, uh, like this is a very minimal model. Uh, Nigel Robinson in the UK has been looking at this from a different angle. And I think that that's where this question is coming at. Uh, that is really exciting, but more complex. That is that the um, a small molecule pool uh, of ligands, like for instance, histine uh, as an amino acid can bind zinc. So the amount of histine in the cell will define how much zinc is not bound to histidine and bound to other ligands like citrate, uh, and that will define availability. So the, the, the cell status uh, will define these windows more precisely uh, because it will define uh, which molecules these, these coppers are bound to. Um, and we define a, 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 a graded uh, availability. This is just a window of free copper that it's just a, a, something that we can define, but we cannot actually measure. Uh, but we can measure what is the, over, the, the global availability of ions in a, in, a, in a cell by having proteins that can bind to those ions and, and measuring if these proteins become methylated with one ion or the other. And that is something that, that is ongoing research. Um, it has been measured, uh, the global metallostasis has been measured for salmonella uh, and to some extent with bacillus subtilis, but with most bacteria, we really don't know where these windows are, if they are higher or lower. For instance, with the streptococcus pneumonia, I just told you that the window of copper is higher, but we don't know where the window of zinc is. Great. Thank you very much, Diana. I think I've got all the WhatsApp and uh, questions in mind as well. Um, obrigada, pessoal, por assistirem. É, o vídeo vai continuar no YouTube para quem quiser assistir mais tarde, depois da aula. É, I'm gonna, eu vou, vou encerrar a transmissão aqui. I'm going to stop uh, the transmission, the broadcasting, Diana. We can uh, keep on streaming art for a little, yeah. a little while longer. Sure. Okay. Tchau, pessoal. Boa tarde.